Amy Dolan here from Lemon Lime Kids. I'm coming to you from my office in Chicago, Illinois, and I am absolutely thrilled to be with you today for the first annual Inclusion Fusion Conference event. So welcome. It's good to be with you. Uh, like I said, I'm coming to you from my office in Chicago, and uh, it's kind of a gloomy, chilly day today, which really, what else can you expect <laughs> from Chicago, right? Uh, most days we describe it gloomy <laughs> and chilly, but uh, the city is fantastic and uh, I, I love living here, so it's really great uh, regardless of <laughs> what the weather is like. So uh, today is Inclusion Fusion, as you know, brought to you by the Key Ministry and PajamaConference.com, and I'm really excited to learn along with you and uh, contribute something to this conversation as well. So. Hopefully you are uh, in a place where you can learn and uh, contribute your own uh, ideas back to uh, what's happening in this conversation today. It's a, it's a much needed conversation. So uh, I lead a company called Lemon Lime Kids and uh, we're a children's ministry consulting company. I uh, founded the company in 2005 and uh, since then have been working on a lot of really, really exciting projects. I'll tell you just a little bit about uh, my company and uh, what we do. Uh, the main thing that Lemon Lime Kids does is offer uh, consulting and coaching for children's directors. Uh, sometimes children's directors who are uh, brand new to ministry uh, or uh, have been in ministry for a long time and just need kind of an extra little uh, bump of advice or uh, a kind of planning for strategic development for a new phase of ministry that they're about to enter. Uh, sometimes children's leaders need uh, some uh, infused confidence and encouragement, and uh, I work alongside children's leaders like that who are uh, trying to take their leadership to the next level and to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching, and that's probably my most favorite part of my job. It's very rewarding, and uh, it's very exciting to uh, really help a children's leader who uh, is in need of something new and to kind of watch as they their spirit comes alive again and the leadership, their ministry comes alive again. It's very, very rewarding. So I love that part of my job. Uh, the other part of my job is curriculum writing and uh, that's my background. I, uh, very, my very first job was at Willow Creek Church uh, writing curriculum for the Promised Land Ministry. And uh, since then I have just fallen in love with uh, writing lessons and thinking about how our lessons and uh, the curriculum that we teach influences our children's uh, faith on Sunday morning. My latest uh, curriculum writing project is called What's in the Bible? This is our latest one, Volume 6, that recently released, and this is a Phil Vischer's project. I lead the curriculum strategic development. We take uh, all that Phil has done and I uh, create this curriculum for churches to use on Sunday morning. It's a uh, biblical literacy uh, curriculum, so we're teaching children um, about the Bible and uh, how the Bible was formed, who wrote the Bible, at the same time teaching them the stories of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So make sure to check this out. It's really fantastic. What's in the Bible.com and you will love it. <laughs> uh, the last thing I get to work on in my uh, company is uh, working on innovative, creative projects uh, for myself, things that I'm most interested in uh, moving forward in children's ministry. And currently, I'm uh, the director of the What Matters Now in Children's Ministry Project, along with my colleagues Henry Zonio and Matt Guevara. And we've created this project called What Matters Now, where we uh, continually ask church leaders what they think matters most in children's spiritual formation. And uh, just recently, we released this second book. It's called What Matters Now in Children's Ministry, the Early Childhood Edition. And we collected responses from 21 early childhood leaders, all really across the, uh, across the world, to answer the question, what they think matters most in the spiritual development of infants through four-year-olds. And uh, we're really, really proud of this project. We're going to be uh, launching a website soon that uh, helps church leaders create resources of their own, just like this, if you have an idea and you want to uh, publish it or launch it, uh, we want to be the team who helps you do that. So make sure to check out cmwhatmatters.com and uh, you can learn all about that project. So let's get to it, shall we? Enough about me. Let's get to it. Today our topic is customizing curriculum. 
And I was excited to talk about this uh, topic with you today because obviously curriculum is important to me. It's a large part of my life. But I believe strongly in uh, each church's ability to customize and tweak their own curriculum so that it's perfect for them. You see, I think that there can there is no perfect curriculum, <laughs> right? That's a funny thing for me to say as a curriculum writer. I think that there is no perfect curriculum. There is no way that a publisher or a writer like me can write things perfectly so that it's exactly right for every single context. There's no way. That's impossible. What I think is that uh, people who write curriculum and create curriculum provide a foundation, a starting place for churches, so that churches then can take that curriculum and tweak it, add to it, delete from it, in order to uh, make it perfect for their context. But a lot of times I don't see churches do that. It's like we sometimes operate on this assumption that the people who created the curriculum that we purchased it from did everything right and uh, knew our context just right and uh, we'll just take it out of the box and use it as is. But I hope that this session encourages you to think about how you might make the curriculum right for your context, how you would not just take curriculum out of the box and use it, but you'd really be mindful about tweaks you could make so that your children learn absolutely the most that they can when they're in your ministry. So uh, customizing your curriculum is a passion of mine. I really believe in it, and I really believe um, that churches uh, should have the skills and the mindset in order to be able to take a curriculum and uh, make it just right. So that's what we're going to talk about today. The first step in uh, customizing your curriculum and making it just right for your kids, obviously, is knowing your kids right? That sounds kind of silly even to say. Here's what I mean. You've got to really know how your kids learn and how your kids interact so that you can tweak the curriculum so that it's just right for you. And I know so many of you who work in special needs ministry, you know your kids. That's what you've got to do, right? You have got to know the unique needs and learning styles of your children. So you've already got that. But if you haven't taken a look yet, whether you're in the special needs ministry or you're in a children's ministry working with children in the church, and you've not taken a look yet at your kids specifically, I encourage you, do that this Sunday. <laughs> Just do it. You've got to know the way that your kids learn and the way that they interact with content the best that you can. And the way that you can learn those things are a couple ways. A few of my suggestions. One, observe your kids. So spend time... Um, when you are not teaching the lesson, spend time kind of in the background as a third party watching. Watch when your kids are silent. Watch when your kids are talkative. And make notes about what you're seeing. What are they learning? Uh, what, can you, what can you best gauge from their interactions? You know, sometimes I'll have churches tell me, uh, we want to increase the connection for our kids to the lessons. We want to encourage uh, more interaction. And I'll ask a further question. I'll say, why? Why do you want to do that? And you say, oh, because they're so quiet. I feel like they're not learning anything. They're so quiet. And um, I tell them, I think a lot of times when children are quiet, they're learning most, right? Would you agree with that? A lot of times when kids are silent, they're processing what they're thinking or uh, they're making deeper connections in their minds. Uh, some kids are uh, more internal processors and so are doing all the work of learning inside before they're able to verbalize it. Some kids are verbal learners and talk first in order to learn. Uh, but we shouldn't use just talking as a gauge of how connected our children are or how um, uh, connected they are to the lesson. We need to observe when they're talking, when they're silent. Make notes. Make notes observing this behavior. And really try to gauge uh, their learning styles. And in order to do this, you've got to use various methods for learning. So um, if you're uh, using an activity that includes art, observe how the children are interacting with it. Are they making deeper connections? Are they applying the lesson? Are they drawing further co conclusions from the activity? Um, if you're using a hands-on, you know, very like uh, physical type activity, take notes. Uh, if you're uh, mostly teaching in an auditory style, 
watch for how your children are responding during those times. If you're teaching using mostly visuals, watch how your children are responding. And take notes. Observe your children during various learning activities and make notes about what their learning styles might be, how they're learning best. Once you know these things, you can tweak your curriculum in order to provide the learning styles that match most with the kids that you have, right? That makes sense. So if you purchase a curriculum that has um, mostly um, art activities, right? Because there's a lot of curriculum that has a lot of art activities. And you've observed that the kids in your specific context don't connect well with art activities or um, you've observed that maybe they don't learn best during art activities, then you need to tweak that curriculum so that there are less of those types of activities. And you can easily do that, you know, um, you can keep the lesson the same, you can keep the um, structure of the activity the same, but instead of an art project, turn it into a large game where the children are running and talking as they're running. That's good. It's fun to see children running and talking, right? <laughs> I love that. Or uh, if the children don't respond well to an art, to art in general, you kind of observed in, the, in your context that that's not right for your kids, then take the basic framework of the art activity and turn it into something um, that's visual. Maybe it's, it's a video instead that shows the same concept. But you get the point. You need to observe your children, what kinds of activities uh, help them learn, and then uh, once you've got your curriculum, watch for those types of activities so that you can tweak it. Now, just a final word on um, uh, observing your kids. Of course, we all know that every, ch every child is a unique, beautiful, wonderfully made creation of God. So while children often have uh, similarities, of course, they're all unique image bearers of God. So just because you make observe observations about one child, make sure not to assume or apply those same observations to every single child. You want to do your best to observe at all of the children if you can, and if not, observe as many of the children as possible. And uh, you can draw conclusions about how to tweak your curriculum once you've made observations of as many of the children as you can. And of course, if you're in a large church and this is something that would take a lot of time and be, and be difficult, employ some of your key leaders to help you with this in order to uh, really know your kids and how they learn so that you'd be able to tweak your uh, curriculum the best you can. So that's step one, know your kids. And don't forget, I feel like I'm, I'm going to say this a hundred times today in this session, you are the expert in your context. You are the expert of your children. So as you're observing your kids, the notes that you make are right. <laughs> Those are correct. And um, I just want to encourage you to uh, remind yourself you are the expert of your children. So if you purchase a curriculum and you take a look at it and you think to yourself, there is no way in the world my kids are going to um, engage in this activity and learn from this activity, delete it. And don't feel bad about it. Don't feel guilty about it. Don't second guess yourself. You are the expert of your children. Nobody knows the children as well as you do in your church context. So act like the expert. If you think something is not going to work, delete it and tweak it so that it's, it's just right for your kids. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to keep on saying that because I really believe that. I really believe that. Okay, let's move on. Uh, in talking uh, further about customizing a uh, curriculum, you want to make sure that you are um, getting feedback as you start uh, making tweaks, you observe your kids, as you start making tweaks to your curriculum, you want to make sure that you're looking at the curriculum from several different perspectives. The parent's perspective, the teacher's perspective, and the child's perspective. So if you start tweaking your curriculum, changing the activities a little bit, or changing the pacing, changing the classroom environment, you want to make sure that you are uh, constantly evaluating and looking at those customizations from a parent's perspective, a teacher's perspective, and the child's, ex child's perspective. So that you're getting a very well-rounded uh, experience on what's a well-rounded opinion on what's happening for your children. So often I'll, I'll be working with churches and they'll say, um, Oh, we want to we want to change up our uh, we want to change up our large group program because the kids are bored. 
And I'll say, okay, we can definitely do that, but let's talk a little bit more about that. How do you know the children are bored? <laughs> and they'll kind of look at me, maybe they'll give a little silly giggle like I just did. <laughs> and they'll say, oh, because we do the same thing every single week, they're bored. And I'll say, okay, that's definitely something to consider. Have your children told you, I'm bored? Sometimes they'll say yes. A lot of times they'll say no. So I'll say, okay, well, that's not a good indicator. Um, have parents come to you in the hallway and said, could you please stop doing that large group program? Could you please stop doing the same thing every single week? My child is bored. And they'll say, no, no, no. <laughs> Parent would never tell us that. And I'll say, okay. Um, so how do you know that the children are bored? And they'll say, oh, because the teachers... The teachers are so sick of teaching the same thing every week. And I'm like, there we go. <laughs> so from one person, from one a group of people's opinion, they're bored with the lesson. And this is so, so common, right? As the teachers, we get sick of the material quickly. I used to be a, an early childhood teacher in the church. And, uh, you know, in early childhood, it's important to repeat the concepts. Repeat the concepts. And uh, we would teach uh, the same thing all the time. And I would lose my mind sometimes saying the same thing. We had multiple services. So I would say the same thing for weeks, multiple times. And then it occurred to me, it doesn't matter as the teacher if I'm sick of saying the same thing. It's important for the children to hear the same concept over and over. That's what matters. So if you're, if you're thinking that your children are bored, really uh, consider it from all the perspectives. Have the parents told you? Have the kids told you? have the teachers told you. A lot of times as teachers, we feel things first and maybe it's not reflective exactly of the children's learning experience. So that's just an example, that, that boredom example was just an example of uh, making sure as you're customizing your activities and uh, tweaking your activities, make sure that you are gaining a perspective from parents, from teachers, and from the children. There's a couple ways you can do this. Of course, Always be asking questions to your parents. How's it going? What are your children saying to you on the way home? Uh, give, give parents cues. Give them a heads up about the activities that they're doing so that parents can ask specific questions. Hey, I heard that you played that game today. Tell me more about it. Um, of course, always be getting feedback from the teachers. Not just how it feels for them to teach, but how they're... Uh, interpreting the children's learning experience, especially when you start making some tweaks and some changes. Ask them, how, what do you think the children are thinking in their mind? How are they responding? What kinds of deeper questions are they asking you? Those are great things to know. And of course, always, always get uh, as most accurate perspective of children and uh, their learning experience as you can. So of course, with the older kids, you can ask them questions. Um, what did you learn today? What did you think today? Um, what did the lesson uh, make you seem new about God today? When they answer questions like that, they can you can easily, um, not easily, but you'll be able to hear in their answers uh, what kinds of deep connections they made as they did learn. Um, for younger kids, you can ask similar questions about uh, what they played with and, again, what they saw and you can watch and see how engaged from their levels that they were. So step two, make sure as you're customizing and you're tweaking your activities that you're looking for various opinions for feedback, parents, teachers, children, so that you're able to uh, take feedback and continue to customize, continue to make changes. Of course, um, this is uh, point three, as you're looking for curriculum, uh, do your best to look for curriculum that's easily customizable. So there are um, increasingly more options of curriculum today that come in uh, Word documents or uh, online formats, uh, writable PDFs that make it easy for you to get the lesson and start deleting, start uh, adding to and tweaking so that it's right for your kids, it's right for your theology, it's just right uh, for your specific context. And I think this really should be the standard. It, it's a little confusing to me why uh, curriculum providers aren't providing customizable curriculum in uh, their formats yet. Some aren't doing that yet for various reasons, but I believe that um, 
curriculum really should have a customizable option so that teachers can make it just right. So if, um, if you have a unique context or you're feeling like the curriculum you purchase is never totally right for your kids, then I'd encourage you to start looking for a curriculum that comes in a format that is able to be customized. It's, it's crazy, and this is going to sound so strange to say, but right now for me, when I choose a curriculum for my church, I am making sure that it is the, the number one value to me is that there's a customizable format. Because I feel like if there's a customizable format, then I can, the, the sky's the limit to me then. I can do anything that I want with it then. So that's, of course, that doesn't have to be your driving value, but that's my driving value right now. And if that's something that's important to you, make sure you ask those questions up front when choosing a curriculum. How uh, customizable uh, will it be? How easy will it be for me? You don't want to spend hours and hours and hours trying to tweak your activities in a format that's really, really difficult and takes more time. You don't want to do that. Okay, as we continue on in our conversation, this is so great. I wish that we were like all together right now so that I could, I could hear what you're saying and, uh, and uh, really see what connections you're making. But uh, we will stay connected and we'll make sure that we uh, have some good conversations so that I can hear uh, how it's going for you in your customizing journey. Well, let's keep going. Obviously, as you customize your curriculum, you also want to be considering um, pacing activities. How are the activities moving so that they're just right for your kids? And sometimes this is, of course, this is not usually written into the curriculum. So as you're tweaking your activities, you want to make sure that you're thinking about pacing. Do you have, do you have activities that are slow moving, more reflective for children, to, more quiet? children to sit quietly and think, or pray, or journal, or process, or talk quietly. Of course, you want to make sure that you have louder activities too, more, um, more uh, energizing activities. Maybe they're physical activities, maybe they're you know, loud talking activities, maybe they're fast-paced videos or graphics. I'm not saying you have to do all of these, but as you're thinking about how to tweak your curriculum to make it just right for yourself, you want to look at the way your activities move. Do they Are there slow activities? Are there loud activities? Is the pacing fast? Is the, are the activities quiet? And of course, as you're observing your children, make sure that you learn and you see how they respond to both. But that's something very, very important. Obviously, not always written into the curriculum. Sometimes you can see activities in curriculum that move fast or that slow down. And if you notice that your kids need, you know, uh, three fast activities and then an equal number of slow activities after that, make sure that you are tweaking your curriculum. And that could be as simple just rearranging activities. You know, maybe the original curriculum writer put fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow type of activities. And you know that you got to get all the fast activities done first in order to move to the slower activities. And that's not even a rewrite or a tweak. You could just rearrange those activities within your curriculum. So take a look as you're customizing the pacing of your activities. And then of course, another really, really important factor to consider in customizing your curriculum is your environment. Sometimes this is written into the curriculum. You know, there'll be uh, staging options, how to, how to build a stage or suggestions for the lighting in the room or the decorations, how to set up your small groups, that sort of thing. Sometimes there won't be. Sometimes that'll be up to you to decide. Regardless whether those suggestions are made in the curriculum you use or not, you want to make sure to give very special attention to the environment that you create. And especially as you start to tweak activities so that they're perfect for you, you want to make sure that you tweak the environment as well. So if you start adding more quiet type activities, more slow paced activities to your lesson, you want to make sure that the environment reflects that. Maybe it's uh, softer lighting, maybe use some you know, Christmas lights, it's just a little bit softer, or um, maybe there's some candles, the little flameless candles, uh, but you want to make sure that you are thinking about the environment. Um, you want to think about the props, the lighting, even the temperature, right? We know as adults, temperature really matters to us when we're engaging in a learning activity. Um, <clears throat> I always bring a jacket or a sweater with me wherever I go because I know the minute that I'm in a room and I feel cold, I will be totally <laughs> distracted. 
And, you know, we put way too much effort into our lessons to have it all ruined by a cold temperature. <laughs> right? So you want to make sure that the temperature is just right for your kids. Um, you know, you can set it in the morning. But then if you've got hundreds of kids coming in, obviously it's going to get hot fast. So pay attention to that. What, is the, what does the temperature feel like? And always be adjusting it so that it's just right for your kid's experience. You want to be thinking about the lighting. We talked about this a little bit before. Um, making sure that the lighting is just right, that it's not too bright for kids, and that it's not uh, too soft for kids also. Because either, either can hurt, right? If it's too soft on a Sunday morning, we're all sleeping. <laughs> If it's too bright on a Sunday morning, it can be just a little too shocking for children and uh, make it difficult for them, obviously, to engage. And then, of course, you want to be thinking, when you're thinking about your environment, you want to include props as well. What kinds of things are you using so that kids can use their fingers, so that they can touch things and continue learning? A lot of time in curriculum activities, I find they suggest props or they give you supplies, that sort of thing. But when I'm leading a small group of kids, I like to have my own little special bucket of props also that I can use um, if an activity is not working or something goes, I'm missing a supply that I need, or just to change it up so that it's just right for my own kids. Some of the things I keep in my little prop, prop basket that I bring, my little prop box, just a little ball. This is like a little rubber baseball. It's not hard at all. And it's just something, it's squishy, it's something nice to just hold in your hands, to pass around the circle as you're talking, that sort of thing. So always keep this in there. I've got some Play-Doh, of course. Things that just, you know, feel good on the fingers. You can pass around as you're talking or you can use, you know, if an activity is not going right, you can uh, abandon the activity and you can pull out the Play-Doh and you can do a million things with this. You can ask kids, you know, to, sh to form one of the characters in today's story and to tell you more about them or uh, form an object that's found in their house that they'll, you know, think about while they're at home this week as they apply the lesson. Or it's just something a tangible that, you know, you can, you can, and maybe sometimes it helps children's brains and their minds to just be doing something with their fingers. So Play-Doh's one that I really love to have with me. Um, I, this is new. I just keep this with me. Now I love it's just like a little. I just got this at the craft store. It's just a little uh, chalkboard. You can see it's got some chalk on it. I just erased it. Get one of these little things. It was like a couple dollars. Uh, my dollar store has like dry erase boards, and I just always keep one of these with me to do something. Um, if I if I want kids to draw the story that they saw today, or uh, draw someone in their life that they're gonna love or serve this week. It's just really a literally a black a blank canvas that you can use um, in order to uh, really apply the lesson and uh, really uh, customize the lesson so that it's just right for you. So think about some props that you can use. Maybe uh, create a, a little bucket of things just like I have that a teacher can have with them at all times. If you have multiple small group leaders, maybe encourage the teachers, each each of the small group leaders, to create their own bucket of things. Obviously, the um, bucket doesn't have to be the same for every group because, uh, of course, the lesson will be customized and uh, be applied differently to every single group of children. So uh, maybe encourage the teachers to think about how they could create their own box of Little manipulatives, little things to touch that are safe for kids, but that um, give them another way to enhance the lesson and to really customize it so that it's perfect just for that exact group. That's something to think about. Okay, and uh, the last thing I want to talk about today is uh, making sure that you train your teachers as you're customizing your curriculum. So if you're a director in a church and um, you've been listening to everything I've been saying and you've been thinking, yes, we need to really not just assume the curriculum is perfect for our church, we need to customize it so that it's just right for our kids, then you want to make sure that you pass along that vision and that training to your volunteer teachers, your volunteer small group leaders so that everyone understands it. Sometimes when I'm working with churches, I'll see um, teachers who think they have to, you know, read the lesson word for word. They got their paper, and they got to, they think, like, this is the lesson. I can't follow it. And, 
it, it's not funny, but sometimes I giggle to myself when I see small group leaders who are like this, <laughs> right? They can't even see their children because they're just like buried in their lesson. Well, that's not what you want, of course. Especially when dealing with children with very unique and special needs, you want the leader to be having great eye contact and great connection with all of the children. So encourage the teachers, train them, envision them in a way that helps them understand, know the lesson, be familiar with it, and also be able to put down your paper and actively engage with the children during the lesson. Um, you want to help them understand that you're customizing the curriculum, you're tweaking it, so you're doing the best you can to change activities if ever their lesson does look funny or has some scribbles out or <laughs> has some deletions or some extra space on the paper. They can know that you feel strongly that the, you, the curriculum should be made just right for your children, and so you're working hard to do that. And invite them into the process, of course. Tell them you need their feedback all the time. So in envisioning them about customization, make sure that you provide a place for them to give their feedback and continue to shape how the curriculum is created just for them. At a church I used to work at, we would uh, do we would we would encourage feedback from teachers by, uh, you know, they would have their paper lesson like this, and then we would encourage them to write right on the lesson their feedback. So like if this, you know, first activity didn't go well, they would like exit out, and then they would write their notes, here's why it didn't work out with my kids. And then we had a box right by the door when they leave, and they just like fold up their lesson, and they would put it right in the box. And it was a really easy way for us to get their feedback immediately on the specific activities that worked and that didn't work. As opposed to, you know, them going home and us emailing them and them remembering to write us back and all of that. It's just an easy way in that moment to say, oh, this activity for next time, we need to tweak it, we need to delete it, we need to add to it, that sort of thing. So I encourage you really uh, think about the way that you're encouraging feedback from your teachers as well. But make sure that you're training them, make sure that you're... Um, giving them the vision of customization, and then even in creating those um, object buckets I was talking about before, give them a great vision that as you're customizing the curriculum for them, they of course should be customizing the curriculum as they teach their children. So if they find that an activity is not working, or they can sense the Spirit of God is moving in a different way than the activity was planned, that they should uh, be in a posture that's open to that and able to really facilitate that well so that the Spirit of God moves amongst the children and the children are able to respond and have an experience with God, really learn new things as well. So those are just a few things. Uh, let's just uh, review for just a minute. First, you want to make sure that you know your kids, that you observe them, and that you know them well. You want to make sure as you're customizing that you're... Um, tweaking the activities from several different perspectives, parent, teacher, child. You want to make sure that you are uh, looking for curriculum that's easy to be customized. You want to make sure that you are aware of the pacing of the activities. Is it fast? Is it slow? How many in a row? You want to make sure that you are creating a great environment so that uh, the environment is just right and the environment is customized for every child with props, with the lighting, with the temperature, all that goes into creating a great environment. And finally, number six, you want to make sure that you're training teachers, empowering and envisioning your volunteers uh, so that they're able to uh, catch the vision of customization. And even more importantly, they're able to lead in the moment when we're there with the children and follow the Spirit's leading. So that's customizing your, customizing your curriculum. That's our topic for today. Thank you so much for participating with me. I would uh, love to hear from you and love to hear uh, any new thoughts that you had, any new ideas that you had, uh, ways that you are going to uh, implement customizing your curriculum now in your church. Uh, please email me, amy at lemonlimekids.com. Email me with your... Um, any other tips, any other suggestions, any questions you, you might have. And uh, I'd love to uh, have further conversation with you about how you are customizing the curriculum so that it's just right for you. And uh, Inclusion Fusion is offering some of the products that I mentioned today uh, available for purchase as the What Matters Now in Children's Ministry. So make sure you grab one of these and uh, purchase it today. And then also make sure that you check out, uh, like I said, what's in the Bible.com for our curriculum. And uh, if you have any questions about uh, any of those products, again, feel free to email me. 
and uh, I'm happy to help, happy to support you however I can. So be blessed in your ministry as you go out and you lead and inspire children to experience God. Be blessed, empowered, and encouraged, and uh, hope to see you real soon. Bye-bye.